good evening everyone uh welcome uh, welcome back for uh, day two sessions so today we will be dealing with ventilation yesterday uh, we had dealt with uh, uh, securing the airway and uh, uh, just uh, for first uh, uh, five minutes we will just recap whatever we uh, learned or uh, we uh, went through yesterday so i will be just highlighting two or three slides from each speaker and then we will go to the uh, uh, topic proper for today so first thing the vortex uh brother i'll get the screen on the powerpoint okay so first thing the vortex by dr satya prakash sir so the uh, take a message of this slide is always uh, try to be in the periphery of the vortex don't fall deep into the vortex call for help early don't let your pride uh, in the way of taking decisions so uh, having said that the 10 commandments for airway control first thing is airway management does not mean intubation oxygenation and ventilation are top priorities be an expert in bag valve mask ventilation preparedness is the key to success know at least one rescue ventilation technique and develop a personal airway algorithm and do not let your pride get in the way that's the most important thing use capnogram to confirm every intubation and when seconds count don't count on seconds practice airway management skills so this was the take home message of the first uh, presentation yesterday the second thing the idea of the uh, talk of the second talk was to uh, make us familiar with what are the uh, induction agents to be used for rapid sequence in different scenarios so most commonly uh, used uh, most common uh, uh, complication what we face in er and icu is shock so different shock which was wonderfully put up by as today speaker dr uh, shekhar sir so for hypovolemic shock uh, for every shock there should be uh, physiological optimization it would start with uh, crystalloids uh, maybe blood maybe colloids in a few situations but more of crystalloids and blood so induction agent for hypovolemic shock ketamine or etamidate and neuromuscular blockade agent is succinylcholine rocuronium uh, likewise for hemorrhagic shock ketamine etamidate for induction agent for neuromuscular blocking agent succinylcholine rocuronium for septic shock ketamine etamidate with steroids uh, a bit controversial but still we can go ahead and a neuromuscular blocking agent should be succinylcholine or rocuronium for cardiogenic shock etamidate Uh, for neuromuscular blocking agent succinylcholine rocuronium uh, putting together for any shock better use a drug which will not uh, cause further hypotension especially avoid propofol so ketamine or etamidate can be used for neuromuscular blocking agent if you have a uh, yesterday's discussion like if we have skermedex well and good you can go ahead with rocuronium or we safest agents would be succinylcholine likewise so again for rsa obstetrics special population so risk of aspiration is there for known reasons and the resaturate foster so meticulous attention to the positioning pre oxygenation and availability of difficult airway equipment and expertise for traumatic brain injury again the choice of drugs is important but varies according to the clinical scenario uh, the myth that succinylcholine uh, will increase icp is no more uh, valid so it doesn't increase icp we can go with succinylcholine opioids we can use for fentanyl remifentanyl which uh, uh, in, uh, suppresses or uh, reduces the scopy response so thereby reducing the rise in icp and uh, map and the lignocaine it suppresses scopy response but no evidence is there and rocuronium uh, can be used in patients where scolin is contraindicated so this is for traumatic brain injury for other scenarios geriatric patient the take home messages the dose should be halved whatever you use for prolonged seizure activity or status epilepticus propofol etamidate for inducing agent and neuromuscular blocking agent you can go ahead with succinylcholine rocuronium in like another scenario scenarios of this carry home message the most uh, uh, important uh, thing is avoidance of adverse events and successful intubation of critically ill patients on first attempt can be possibly influenced by operator related factors like training and experience so keep on training under your mentors so that you do succeed on the first attempt suppose you don't uh, succeed on the first attempt the first thing is das so difficult intubation guidelines uh, that uh, we can go through in all the uh, references a nap for review make the first attempt at trachea intubation your best attempt was the first uh, was the uh, take home message and this was the different strategies which evolved through the years for uh, uh, reducing ventilator induced lung injury like uh, keeping platter pressures less than 70 peep application and tidal volume less than 4 to 8 ml kg which we, we are all following and don't forget about the mechanical power putting all the factors together mechanical uh, power mechanical power can play an important role in causing ventilator induced lung injury and belly prevention putting all to get all together ventilation strategies adjunctive strategies hemodynamics and others and pharmacological interventions and one more uh, good message conveyed was one week of antibiotic uh, therapy is sufficient no need to continue for 8 uh, or 15 days there was no uh, evidence that 15 days is essential and also there were a st uh, few studies which showed that uh, 15 days antibiotics may increase antibiotic resistance 
and uh, prevention of uh, wap is essential so avoid intubation if possible minimize sedation early mobilization early enteral nutrition and so on so while interpreting uh, abg in respiratory failure patients keep in mind about mixer disorders there may be respiratory acidosis along with metabolic alkalosis as well so mixer disorders should be kept in mind and sampling sampling errors like air bubble delay in analysis too much heparin and venous sampling these should be kept in mind and yesterday the final question of uh, discussion was how to check the validity probably the speaker got the uh, question wrong that's why uh, there was a confusion so this one was shared in the delegates uh, group by one of the uh, delegates dr sundaram from chennai so we can go through this this one uh, looks apt answer for that question so i'm not going to discuss this this is in delegate group you can go through this so that ends the recap moving on to the uh, first talk of today so today actually the talk was uh, uh, to be taken by dr didipa deva prasad sir a consultant in apollo chennai uh, as i said before uh, due to the icism election norms he is not able to address any meet, uh, gather, gatherings uh, till his uh, election is getting over so his uh, one of his colleague dr gautam andrear from apollo a junior consultant in apollo hospitals intensive care unit will take up the session so over to dr gautam andrear the first talk will be on bipap machine no its hardware and applications over to dr gautam mandir good evening one and all i first thank the organizing committees and dr didipa deva prasad uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity uh, we will see uh, both the bipap uh, bipap as the name implies it's a bilevel positive airway pressure uh it delivers uh, pressure during inspiration is called ipap and one during expiration is called epap and the difference between the ipap and epap is the pressure support uh we will see the importance of this in upcoming slides ipap uh, the eye pressure during the inspiration relieves the respiratory muscle fatigue and this can improve the co2 washing it increases it helps also to increase the tidal volume as is the patient with respiratory failure epap the airway pressure provided during exhalation serves to prevent the airway collapse the epap nothing between the uh, is a peep it helps improving the oxygenation the indications of bipap are level one indications are exacerbation of copd cardiogenic pulmonary edema both the cpap and the bipap are level 1a evidence but when there is co2 build up there is hypercapnia then bipap is the choice of thing than the cpap uh, mild to moderate ards there is a notification over here that's the moderate ards is the pf ratio between 100 to 200 but the studies tells when pf ratio is less than 150 there are high chance of nav failure so we can go for intubation directly than of nav pneumonia in immunocompromised patient pneumonia per se is a 38 to 40% of failure rate uh, but when compared to immunocompromised patients the intubation increases their chance of infection intubation will increase their mortality so you can go with bipap for the initial period until they decompensate or to the patients who suffer post extubation failure these are the level one indication there are other indications too the electromagnetic like failure chest along with adequate pain relief 3b evidence reducing dyspnea in palliative care in 2a or nav with appropriate use during bronchoscopy or endoscopy to improve oxygenation even for intubation you can use the bipap for oxygenation is a 3b evidence for the contraindications inability to protect the airway patients example is rta of gcs8 no point of putting in bipap directly can go for intubation someone with hemodynamic instability and triple vasopressors patient is shock patient is tachypneic no point of waiting to them inability to fix the interface patient has facial trauma or facial surgery directly can intubate the patient severe ga symptoms if someone with acute abdomen or patient with severe vomiting there are high risk of aspiration so we can avoid bipap and go for intubation someone with massive hemoptysis or copious secretion who couldn't clear it out same thing you can go for intubation can avoid because of aspiration or someone with post cardiac arrest monitoring uh, subjective responses as me like once you put the patient on bipap you should monitor them whether it's 
comfort to them is patient is cooperative is patient is agitated or delirious or claustrophobic and check the monitor whether patient is adequately delivering when patient intake is good vital signs as we all know once you put the patient on bipap that's putting a patient on positive pressure ventilation there is high probability patient may get hemodynamic instability bp may drop there also will be the uh, catecholamines uh, will be highly secreted because of their stress period when you mask it on putting a bipap that also might mask the patient and patient might go to hypotension bradycardia just observe it very closely breathing effort once you put the bipap monitor whether patient is still using his accessory muscles or patient still has paradoxical breathing or development of complications Com these three might uh, make it acute but complications acutely until patient has pneumothorax or patient is self harm it don't make any acute complications more of compli uh, chronic complications which you will see in the upcoming slides predictors of niv failure high severity score of illness by seeing apache 2 or sofa score older age age more than 65 failure to improve after one hour of NIV, you initiated with uh, NIV, still patient is not settled out tachypneic or hypoxic. This is uh, a high predictor of NIV failure or any multi-organ involvement or you put the patient on NIV with pH of less than 7.25 and PCO2 of more than 75. After two hours, you do ABG and it's not responded out. Then it's a uh, patient has some NIV failure. Difficulty to identify the etiology of uh, respiratory failure. Patient is tachypneic hypoxia. You put them on NIV. You no need. You don't know the cause. Uh, patient is still tachypneic and still hypoxic. It's uh, more probability patient go for failure. High tidal volume generation. High tidal volume means more than nine ml per kg. Patient is generating more than nine ml per kg. Patient is still tachypneic and high probability of failure and VO2 FA2 less than 150. Patient's education. Before you put uh, BiPAP, NIV or CPAP, you have to educate the patient because they will have the claustrophobia, patient will have high pressure, they might have uh, pressure sores, they will have uh, dry mouth, so they will have a tight seal around the face, so you have to educate the patient. Please allow the patient to hold the mask in their hand before you put the strips. So it will help the patient to cooperate with the BiPAP and go forward. First initial few minutes will be the tougher period, educate them. And if bystanders are nearby, explain them also about the events and educate them too. Uh, there are different types of BiPAP masks, which uh, most of the thing we'll be using too. Uh, the These are called the nasal masks. Uh, we will see the individual advantage and disadvantages of these things. Nasal mask, easy to fit and uh, you can put it very comfortably, allow the patient to speak. Even if patient has copious secretions, they can split it out. Decrease in aspiration, less of claustrophobic. The main disadvantage is mouth leak. If patient is power pressure is going through the nose, if patient is taking mouth breath because of tachypnea or exacerbation, the pressure might get leaked through the mouth and increase in resistance through the nasal passage because of high pressure. Uh, this is the total face mask. Uh, total face mask biggest disadvantage is it has a residual volume of 250 ml. So there is a high probability of uh, re-inspiration of the air present in that. So there is high possibilities of CO2 re-breathing is high thing. Uh, so the uh, acute exacerbation, the washing out CO2 will be very less. This again is the uh, nasal mask, which almost the same one. This is the total face mask. The to uh, full face mask, uh, this is a total face mask, this is a full face mask. The main advantage of full face mask is decreases air leak through the mouth. If you put the appropriate mask, in a patient will have good comfortable through that, decreases airway resistance. The negativity is increase the risk of aspiration and asphyxia as the same as total face mask. And when you come to the full face mask, there are vented masks and non-vented masks. We'll see in detail about the next side. Before that, we'll see about this helmet. 
the main disadvantage of helmet is same as total face mask there will be like a uh, single expiratory port so there will be like recirculation of the expiratory air within this helmet so there will be co2 rebreathing is high possibility and increase in patient asynchrony uh, because of peep uh, like uh, even if you put i peep there will be a high chance of asynchrony but patient will be feeling much comfortable in this because no pressure over their face uh, just the pressure around the shoulder patient will be much comfortable on this it's not still approved in us it's okay but uh, these are the total uh, full face mask you can see this vented mask okay this there is a vent over there uh, there is a vent uh, vent over here here the vent is over here here the vent is over the connector it has its own advantages uh, we can't uh, in upcoming uh, newer devices there is no expiratory separate wall there is only single wall which comes to the inspiratory wall so there is no expiratory wall separated over there so there is a space over here which allows the patient uh, during inspiration and expiration there is no separate wall so the pressure will get washed out through this wall so you should be very careful when there is a single port make sure you make a vented mask when there is a bile two tubes over there and two connectors over there you can make sure you can put the non vented mask to the thing so you should make sure whether it is a single tube or double tube and put the mask accordingly whether vented or non vented uh, this is the anti asphyxial wall the main advantage over this is if patient is connected to the bipap in case patient had uh, disconnected to the bipap or technical defect the machine has switched off or that you restrain the patient patient will get restless and you think it, uh, the patient is getting restless to some other thing but patient will get asphyxiated this is the wall which helps the patients to uh, anti asphyxial wall to breathe in there is a closure one way wall over there which during breathing in it might open so patient will won't get asphyxiated breath is, patient can still breathe in through this even machine is discontinued for the certain or machine is uh, default not working for the time uh, humidification uh, definitely humidification helps the patient synchrony because of high pressure there is high probability patient will get uh, dry mucosa and asynchrony is more probability of the and secretions will get dried up and high uh, probability of intubation failure during intubation in case patient needs intubation so routinely humidification is not recommended humidification is recommended if patient is not tolerating it or thick secretions uh, it's advisable to put a patient on humidification and if you put humidification patient synchrony will be better this is a hme filter hme filter is especially used in a double port uh, bypass because hme filter works uh, in that mechanism because air should go in and go out so that it get humidifiers and it makes the air humidification if only single port is there it won't get used out so you should make the humidification for the single port and if there is a double port is there then hme would have helped out the negative of putting hme in that case it increases the dead space and patient would take extra breath over from it so better choice is to put the humidification if no other go you can put the hnf nebulization because uh, most of the patient who is recurring uh, bipap or nav would be the co2 exacerbation so patient will definitely recur a nebulization you can't avoid nebulization in such case so which is a better nebulization whether you should give them uh meter dose nebulization or nebulizer uh the study states efficacy of aerosol delivering is similar for nebulizer and mdi when leak port is located in the circuit not on the mask as you see leak port is in the circuit not on the mask in that case you just uh, put the aerosol device in a space between the leak space and the mask 
So the efficacy is same for both MDI meter dose inhaler and the nebulizer. In case if leak port is there in the mask, as we seen on the slides, if leak port is in the mask, meter dose inhaler is more efficient than the nebulizer. That to give the meter dose inhaler during the inspiratory phase. In case there is no meter dose inhaler is available, you want to give the nebulizer, you can decrease the expiratory pressure so that it uh, decreases the loss of uh, aerosols during the expiratory leak. So decrease the expiratory pressure during that time and increase the item during the uh, nebulization period. So it helps to deliver the nebulization adequately. Complications of BiPAP, the major complications of aspiration, you can avoid it of uh, making the patient tolerable and avoid the BiPAP to the uh, acute abdomen or someone is vomiting or massive hemoptysis or uh, other thing is hypotension. As we told, because of positive pressure ventilation, the preload will get decreased. So, patient will go for hypotension. So, check the BP very closely. Mucus plugging, because of thick secretions, the dry air, there is high possibilities of mucus plugging and claustrophobia. These are the major complications. The pressure problems are pressure sore, sinus pain and gastric insufflation. The pressure sore or sinus pain can be avoided by applying a dermopain plaster over the um, mask site and there are multiple newer masks available to avoid it out, applying the adequate moisturizer during the care. Uh, sinus pain, uh, you can avoid putting it too tight and you can put the mask alternative strips as tight as possible so that you can keep changing it and it will avoid the pain over the sinus area. Gastric insufflation, increase the patient uh, to breathe in through the nose and avoid patients to take in through the swallow it during the inspiration. And if patient is still abdomen distant and significant aerophagia is there, Better to put the rice tube and in intermittent aspiration will avoid gastric insufflation, which we can prevent the aspiration. Airflow related dryness, nasal congestion and eye irritation. You can adequately lubricate your eye. Nasal congestion and dryness you can avoid by putting the humidification. Modes of BiPAP. Uh, as we all know, uh, there are uh, spontaneous mode, uh, tea time, ST mode and PSV mode. We mostly use ST mode in our settings. And uh, you know like why? Because you know like uh, spontaneous mode, breathe or pressure triggered and cycled. Pressure itself will trigger and cycle within a spontaneous mode. Uh, you know like uh, devices trigger IPAP and flow sensor deduct spontaneous inspiratory effect from the patient and they cycle back to EPAP. It is like patient uh, uh, completely done by the patient. If patient is not taking adequately, it won't give the breath. Only if patient takes it, it gives. Whereas in time, EPAP and IPAP cycling is purely machine triggered. At a set rate, typically expressed breath per minute. If you put like 18 breath per minute, it gives only 18 breath per minute. It won't overgive or decrease it up. Whereas in ST mode, it's a combine of these two. Uh, breaths uh, or patient trigger on machine trigger. It depends. If patient is not adequately triggering, machine will trigger. Means you can set up the backup rate. If patient is not adequately triggering uh, per minute, machine will have a backup rate which machine will trigger it. Out. Like, like spontaneous mode, the device triggers the IPAP on patient inspiratory effort. But in ST, backup uh, rate is also set to ensure that patients still receive a minimum number of breath per minute. Whereas pressure support mode, uh, same as in uh, ventilator, tidal volume delivery is dependent on the flow and the duration of inspiratory phase. Whereas inspiratory flow reaches a certain threshold level, cycling from the inspiration to expiration occurs. Both ST and PSV are almost the same and it is patient friendly. You can start with ST mode or PSV mode. Whereas R time, no like uh, R time, the speed at which the inspiratory pressure increases to set the target pressure. 
you know like uh, patient may need a longer time uh, for the inspiration or shorter time to the inspiration for example patient is copd acutely exacerbation they love a short inspiratory time and the longer expiratory time for them the rise time is slower that is like 3 or 4 you kept uh, their inspiratory time will be very low they will be like example uh, if you kept the inspiratory rise time of 4 patient is on respiratory rate of uh, 28 or 30 patient is copd pco2 is 38 so adequate tidal volume won't be reached so keep the rise time adequately as per the patient condition patient is an acute respiratory failure may be flow starved uh, therefore needing a short rise time to meet their demand demand uh, you can also examine the waveform and minute ventilation will in, uh, will ensure proper setting so you can see here okay see here the rise time is acute and is stagnant uh, before uh, like see here the slope is over there so your rise time is very slow so it rises slowly rises and just declines here the rise time is short so it just peaks up and set ends up so rise time should be set up as per the patient condition uh, Whereas I time, how long the inspiratory phase lasts? Well, like IE ratio, same as IE ratio. If patient is COPD, you need of more of expiratory time, make uh, as a short I time. If patient is an ARDS, you need more of inspiration than expiration, you need permissive hypercapnia, then you keep as long I time and short uh, expiratory. Well, the initial setting. Initiate the EPAP of approximately 4 to 5, whereas IPAP of 8 to 10. Uh, the higher CO2, if patient has higher carbon dioxide, then increase the pressure support. That is the difference between the EPAP and IPAP. I have, I have the example for that, so you can understand this and clearly during the example thing. Uh, if patient has low O2, increase the FAO2 or PEEP. The basic rules is if patient has high PCO2, increase the pressure support. If patient has low PCO2, that is uh, patient has PCO2 of 50, you have to increase the pressure support whether to increase the IPAP or decrease the EPAP so that you can increase the pressure support. If patient is as low PCO2, same as decrease the pressure support. If patient is hypoxic, whether increase the FIO2 or EPAP, where IO2 decrease the FIO2 or EPAP, it depends upon the patient condition. Meaning from BIPAP, there is no specific uh, meaning mode. Come down on uh, EPAP and IPAP as low as you can. Once uh, we EPAP and IPAP has come down, then you can wean it out timingly. Like two hours BiPAP and two hours face mask. Ask if patient is not hypoxic COPD, want to keep saturation between 88 to 92, let them be in room air. Make them two hours on BiPAP and two hours on room air, then slowly increase it out. Two hours on BiPAP and four hours on room air, two hours on BiPAP and six hours on room air. Then daytime and rumor, overnight BIPAP, and slowly wean off accordingly. As uh, days, it takes days, some might take weeks, it depends upon the patient. And there is no exact time period for that. Like example, uh, see, case one, uh, it's a uh, 65 years old male, uh, known smoker, COPD, uh, came to the ED with uh, acute exacerbation, breathing difficulty. Uh, patient has profuse sweating. You did a ABG. ABG shows pH of 7.28, bicar uh, PCO2 of 78, and PAO2 of 70. Uh, patient already you put on BiPAP. This is a setting. IPAP of 16, EPAP of 8, FAO2 35%. Okay. So, like uh, patient has pH of 7.28, PCO2 78. Okay. So, now you want to decrease the PCO2 and increase the pH further. Already patient pressure support is 8. 16 minus 8 is 8. Okay. So patient has PAO2 of 70, saturation of 96. You no need that much uh, oxygenation for the patient. You can maintain saturation of 88 to 92. PAO2 of 60 is sufficient for COPD patients. Okay. So what will be the ideal setting you like to change in this patient on BIPAP? Like Pressure support is 8, right? You can uh, increase the IPAP to 18. You can maintain the EPAP of 8 and decrease the FA2 of 30. 
and see the saturation. No need to uh, do a AB tube to check the PAO2. You can maintain the saturation. Saturation 88 to 92 is sufficient. So, here uh, pressure support is 10 because you increase the IPAP from 16 to 18. So, patient EPAP is same. I have not changed. I have come down on FAO2. E IPAP have been increased from 16 to 18. So, after two hours, you have repeated the ABG with the same setting, same patient. pH is 7.32, PACO2 is 55, where uh, oxygenation is wanted because of nebulization spasm improved. Uh, uh, sorry, you made a study. So, PAO2 is, it has been increased. So, now what is the change you would be like to do it on your BiPAP machine? You see the pressure support is 10. Okay, already pressure support is 10. FIO2 is 30. Uh, so, you want to increase the further uh, pressure support and I can decrease on EPAP or I can decrease on FIO2. Already saturation is uh, FIO2, I kept on 30. So, my ideal setting is I would have decrease the EPAP. EPAP, I made it to 6. So, now pressure support is 12. Uh, so, uh, saturation is 30. If patient saturation is further good, PSPO2 is more than 92, you can further come down on FIO2. You can keep it even in room at 21%. Okay. So, after 2 hours, you did a ABG. Patient has pH of 7.4 and PSCO2 of 40. So, that would be the ideal setting for this patient. So, we can do the serial ABGs and monitor and you can set the BIPAP accordingly. Uh, it's uh, case 3. Uh, this patient is uh, 38 years old female, uh, delivered two days back, came with breathing difficulty. Uh, patient has true hypoxia, uh, saturation was 72 in the room map. So, patient has put on BIPAP, uh, which is comfortable. Uh, you did a ABG after a heart. ABG shows pH of 7.39, PACO2 of 38, and oxygenation of 52. Saturation of 88 was there. So, what will be the change, ideal changes you can do? Whether you can increase the EPAP or you can increase the FAO2. Uh, in this setting, I can increase the FAO2. Okay, FAO2 is increased to 45. So, patient saturation has been increased to 96. So, we assume PAO2 also would have been increased. Did a ABG after 2 hours, PAO2 was 74 in this setting. So, uh, PCO2 was 35 and pH of 7.42. We are just maintaining the same setting. Patient is clinically improved, maintained on BiPAP, intubation have been avoided and patient have been dissolved after 3 days. Take home points. Consider BiPAP in COPD exacerbation or cardiogenic pulmonary edema or acute uh, respiratory failure in immunocompromised patients, second pneumonia. Full face mask is the preferred initial interface for the acute application because of the complications and disadvantage of the other mask. Increase EPAP to treat the hypoxia and increase pressure support. That is the difference between IPAP and EPAP to wash out the PCO2 and to reduce the work of breathing. When BiPAP is failing, intubation or NIV should be should not be delayed. Intubation is a call which should be done by the treating physician. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. To the point, uh, thanks, Dr. Gautam. Yes. Uh, I, I, I could not see any questions here, so I hope. Uh, no, I don't find any questions in the chat box. So uh, we'll move to the next presentation. Thanks, Dr. Gautam. Yeah, question. sure. Thank you. I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, hold on. Hold on, sir. Please stay online. Okay, that's a question. Uh, from Dr. Muthukumar to Dr. Gautam. How much of leak is acceptable when patient on NAV? Continuous NAV or intermittent NAV, which is ideal? Sir, up to 60% leak has been acceptable. Then NAV bypass has an advantage of Synchronizing with the good leak. BiPAP is much better when there is a leak. Up to 60% you can allow. It can compensate, the pressure can compensate to it. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, the second question from uh, Dr. Muthukumar was, a continuous NAV or intermittent NAV, which is ideal? It depends upon the patient. 
it depends upon the patient clinical condition. There is no studies involving continuous NAV or intermittent NAV. You have to do the serial ABG and you should wean off when the patient is fit until the continuous NAV or BIPAP. Good. Okay, sir. So, we have next question from Dr. Vijay Ravi. Why in asthma, BIPAP didn't score well compared to the top COPD? Yeah. See, uh, previously studies tells when patient is in asthma, you have to intubate the patient because of their smaller airway problem. It's uh, COPD, you like, uh, it's uh, not the spasm as in asthma. Even in intubation, the treating the patient on ventilator and asthma is a hard. You can't uh, ventilate the patient with asthma. In spite of ventilating, you have to give the continuous nebulization, paralyze them, start them on ketamine, start them on deriflin, start them on propofol. If patient is thus spasmodic, intubate the patient. NIV always is a uh, catastrophic thing in asthma. You can't put the patient in asthma patients on NIV or BiPAP because it's a smaller airway problem. Hope you got the answer, Dr. Uh, uh, Muthukumar. Sorry, uh, yeah, Muthukumar. So, sorry, Dr. Vijay Ravi. Next question from Dr. Vijay Ravi is, Riles tube intermittent aspiration, how to overcome the interface issues? Yeah, routinely Riles tube is not indicated. We put Riles tube to the patient, someone who's like iris for aspiration or significant abdomen distension, uh, secondary to aerophagia. Then continuous aspiration, intermittent aspiration is a better one because continuous aspiration there might be mucus might be get clamped to it. So if you put the suction intermittently suction it out, so in spite of mucosal stucking out to the thing because of negative pressure, it might get emptied out. When there is no only the continuous aspiration is there that you are not sucking out due, by putting the negative pressure, the mucus are get clamped to the opening and there might be regain aerophagia or secretion and iris for aspiration. Okay, sir. So next question, Dr. Rocky Mamilla. Sir, in your cases, how much rice time, eye time you have fixed? Rice, as I told, if patient is COPD, patient will have a short inspiratory time and patient will have long expiratory time. So in that case, you can keep the short inspiratory time. Okay, patient, they will have a short inspiratory and long expiration. So in that case, you can keep the long, short inspiratory time. If patient is having restricted lung disease or neuromuscular weakness, or patient is having ARDS, so you need of more of inspiration than the expiration. In such cases, you can increase the inspiratory time and decrease the expiratory time by increasing the eye time or eye ratio. Yes, the next question from Dr. Praveen Chandran. NAV or invasive ventilation for cardiogenic heart failure? Uh, kindly opine. Yeah, see, as I always told, and cardiogenic failure, both CPAP and BiPAP and NAV, all three have the equivalent thing. There are both all three have one class, one year evidence. If patient has CO2 retention, patient couldn't wash the CO2, then there comes the BiPAP for the rescue. CPAP is contraindicated for that. It's a level 2B evidence. So if patient has CO2 retention, NAV and BiPAP both has equal ratio but uh, CPAP has no role if patient has CO2 retention because you need pressure support. CPAP gives only the EPAP. It doesn't have the pressure support. NIV and BiPAP both have the equal ratio. Okay. Uh, so next question from Dr. Deepak Raj. How frequent we should take ABG analysis for uh, patients on BiPAP and on in, uh, and intubated patients? Yeah. See, uh, ABG analysis it depends. If you want to do it hourly, hourly, or second hourly, second hourly, or sixth hourly. My, uh, there is no clear cut evidence you have to do like every hourly ABG or second hourly ABG. It depends on the clinical scenario. You put the patient on BiPAP, repeat the ABG after a half. If it is improving, then you can make it a sixth hourly or twelfth hourly or even OD is sufficient. If patient is not improving, it's further worsening. Then you change the setting and repeat the ABG after one hour. There is no like serial point like do it every hour or every second hour. It depends upon the clinical. Agreed. So final question for this session from yeah. Dr. Rocky Mamilla. So what is the rise time in C sorry rise time for COPD versus ARDS? Yeah, as I told, rise time in COPD. If patient will have the short inspiratory thing, so you should keep the short rise time. So that see, for example, patient will take the breath of thirty eight. 
you have given a rise time of uh, four or five. So patient will have the slow rise time. If you check the BIPAC, patient would have been take the tidal volume of 250 or 260. If you decrease the rise time to one patient, you can see the change of tidal volume from 260 to 340 or 350. So you can give the adequate rise time where their oxygenation also will get improved in them. Same like KRDS, patient will be tachypneic, they have the short inspiratory and expiratory time. So in that time, if patient is, yes, uh, you can allow the uh, hyper, uh, permissive hypercapnia and ERDS. So you need of more of inspiratory thing. So if patient is uh, fit on by adequate inspiration, expiration is taking it out. So begin it slowly. It depends upon the patient synchrony. The more the faster you keep, the more patient discrony will be there. If you keep it on to, it, uh, it will be the gradual thing with patient synchrony will be very good. So it also depends upon the patient uh, synchrony. Just ask the patient, see the monitor. As I told previously in my site, you can uh, see the rise time monitor. You can see whether it is slope or straightly rising down. And you can ask the patient, yes, no question. Keep it uh, rise time one, ask the patient whether it is okay. Is it okay for you? Is Are you comfortable with this? If patient tells no, make it two and see the monitor. If patient is uh, accepted for that, patient is okay, keep it as two. Fine, sir. So thanks for the wonderful uh, uh, replies. And thanks for our time once again. Uh, once again, thank Dr. Dilipa uh, uh, Prasad sir, and Dr. Gautam Mandir for this wonderful session. So thank you, sir. So moving on to the next session. Uh, next session is on, uh, so uh, we have dealt with uh, non-invasive ventilation. Moving on to invasive ventilation. So next talk is by Dr. Uh, Marali Tangaraj, sir, consultant KMCH Institute of Health and uh, Science Research. Uh, modes of invasive ventilation and how to initiate ventilation, that is initial ventilator settings. Okay, uh, so Dr. Murali, sir, one of my teachers in uh, critical care training. Uh, so uh, he did his MBBS from uh, Coimbatore Medical College and MD Anesthesiology from uh, Chhatrapati uh, Shagaji Maharaj Medical University, Lucknow, and IDCCM from PSG. And he worked as consultant uh, in PSG Medical College and moved to KMCH. And he, uh, he is currently working in KMCH Medical College. And he finished his fellowship in neurocritical care last year. Uh, so moving on to the presentation, so invasive ventilation, how to initiate ventilator. Uh, go, uh, over to you, sir. Marali, sir. Okay. Uh, at first, I would like to thank Dr. Nishant for uh, giving me this opportunity. When we talk about mechanical ventilation, it is important to know when it was started. Actually, in 1952, it was started in polio epidemic period in Copenhagen. Initially, iron lungs were used. But the main problem with iron lung were it showed 80 to 90 percent of mortality. The iron lung was used was based on the concept of a spontaneous ventilation, so this negative pressure ventilation. Once the ventilation evolved and uh, they started doing tracheostomy followed by ventilation with bag mask ventilation, which reduced the mortality to the half from 80 to 90 percent. And this is the picture which you can clearly see. Uh, these are the iron. Sorry, uh, these are the iron ventilator where the patients are kept inside the ventilator and a negative pressure is created so that the uh, because of negative pressure patients is able to breathe. The mechanical ventilator is an artificial external organ which was originally uh, conceived to replace the ventilatory system but later it has become a device which assists the inspiratory muscle. The primary function of the mechanical ventilator is basically to promote alveolar ventilation and CO2 elimination, but they are often also used for correcting impact oxygenation. Uh, coming to respiratory failure, for which we usually resort to mechanical ventilation, it can be classified as a pump failure or a lung failure. If we see our respiratory system as a gas exchanger, that is primarily by the function of the lung, which is ventilated by the pump. Here, uh, the pump means the thoracic cage, which consists of uh, ribs, intercostal muscles, and other uh, accessory muscles, uh, including uh, diaphragm, which is used for the respiration. The dysfunction of either of lung or a pump can cause respiratory failure. Usually, it is defined as an inability to maintain an adequate gas exchange while breathing at a ambient air or a, uh, what you call it as a FAO2 at a at room. The uh, lung failure can occur because of alveolar dysfunction, airway obstruction or vascular dysfunctions. And pump failure can occur because of excessive load, which may lead to fatigue and intrinsic dysfunction. 
and we come uh, when we see pump failure pump failure primarily results in alveolar hypoventilation hypercapnia and respiratory acidosis and there are multiple causes for pump failure which may be uh, one of the uh, most common cause would be uh, respiratory center dysfunction central or peripheral nerve dysfunction and uh, uh, chest wall issues which may lead to low compliance of the chest wall which may lead to pump failure excessive load caused by airway obstruction or low compliance or a high ventilatory requirement uh, will all uh, culminates in intrinsic pump dysfunction due to respiratory muscle failure and when we talk about lung failure uh, lung failure may result from the damage to the gas exchanger units such as alveoli airways or the vessels uh, bronchial vessels and lung failure involves impaired oxygenation and impaired co2 elimination and it's also important to note that the pump failure may cause lung failure due to accumulation of secretions inadequate ventilation and atelectasis and lung failure may cause pump failure due to high impedance and increased ventilatory requirement when we talk about mechanical ventilation it can be either an invasive mechanical ventilation or non invasive mechanical ventilation so as uh, now uh, the previous uh, talk was about non invasive ventilation now i am going to resort to the mechanical ventilation which is an invasive ventilation and what are the advantages of invasive ventilation is it is protecting the lungs from major aspiration protect the upper airway and gastrointestinal tract from positive pressure it relieves any upper airway obstruction it provides an easy access to the airway for suction and bronchoscopy it helps in reduction in the dead space and it also enables a stable and safe connection between the patient and the ventilator but everything comes with a disadvantage the disadvantages here would be the loss of protective function of upper airway that is basically heating and humidification of the inspired gas and protection from the infection and decreased effectiveness of cough which may results in sputum retention and atelectasis and increased airway resistance and risk of airway injury and loss of ability to speak when we talk about uh, mechanical ventilation the clinical context for which we are mechanically ventilating the patient has to be kept in mind like physiological tasks to manage such as oxygenation or for co2 elimination or for assistance of respiratory muscles and also we should know about the primary lung condition whether there is no disease or the patient is having an obstructive or a restrictive lung disease and also it's important to know the timing of the start up of the mechanical ventilation whether we need to escalate the ventilation and when it has to be de escalated and weaning and there has to be an uh, approach whether the mechanical ventilation should be an aggressive or a conservative strategy like lung protection ventilation in ards or balanced strategy has to be kept in mind when we talk about mechanical ventilation it is important to note the phases of mechanical ventilation and first phase is the initiation phase which starts at the end of expiration at this stage the breath is triggered that is it breath is initiated either by a machine or by the patient next come the second phase is the inspiratory phase once the breath is triggered the inspiratory flow begins and this phase is defined as air flow into the patient and the third phase will be your plateau phase here there is an inspiratory pass and it allows uh the plateau phase to occur and this is also called as the phase of absence air flow and this is the phase where the gas exchange happens in the alveoli next comes your expiratory phase then expiratory phase is where uh, the it uh, ventilator cycles from inspiration to expiration and it allows the patient to exhale passively and before going in for the uh, proper ventilator setting it is very important to note that few basic settings has to be kept in mind like rate tidal volume or inspiratory pressure depending upon uh, what type of uh, mode we are going to keep and fio to peep i ratio and the pressure support and when we talk about uh, invasive mechanical ventilation we should know about the control variable what is the control variable we are going to choose whether it is a pressure control ventilation or a volume control ventilation when coming to volume control ventilation as the name suggest here the volume is controlled so that the set volume is delivered once the set volume is delivered then ventilator Uh, either exhales or it goes for a hold for an inspiratory pass for few second the advantage of volume control ventilation here also 
uh, seen uh, that time in this also is a controlled uh, variable in this uh, volume control ventilation. So there is a set respiratory cycle time. So it makes that inspiration must be completed within the predetermined period. And uh, in this mode of ventilation, the flow also remains constant until the volume is delivered. The main uh, problem here is the pressure is not constant and the pressure fluctuates depending upon the lung resistance. When we talk about pressure control ventilation, as name mentioned, here the pressure is controlled and there is a set pressure. Once you that is reached, the ventilator cycles from inspiration to expiration. Even in pressure control ventilation, time is again a controlled variable here. There is a set respiratory cycle time so that the inspiration is completed within the predetermined time. Regarding flow in pressure control ventilation, the flow starts high till the desired pressure is reached and then decreases onto a slope so that it can maintain the pressure. And regarding the volume, volume may vary in pressure control ventilation depending upon the compliance of the lung. Next comes the variables which has to be set during mechanical ventilation. The first variable is the trigger. Trigger is nothing but what initiates the breath. It can be a time trigger, flow trigger or a pressure trigger. Flow trigger is most commonly used to trigger and uh, one should keep in mind that uh, uh, flow trigger should be sensitive enough to detect the patient effort but should not cause a respiratory fatigue. When we see about time trigger, it is decided by the machine and it's usually a machine's choice and the next breath is a mandatory ventilation. Usually we set a uh, respiratory cycle time and set an IE ratio. So once the expiration finished, the machine itself triggers uh, the uh, next breath. When we talk about flow trigger, it's usually a patient choice. Whenever the patient tries to take a breath and there is a fluctuation in the flow, which is detected by the ventilator, once there is a fluctuation detected and the machine triggers and uh, inspiration is delivered. And coming to pressure trigger, this is also a patient choice trigger. And the same way as flow trigger, once the patient is trying to uh, take a breath, once it detects a uh, negative pressure and it measures the negative pressure, uh, once the uh, machine is able to measure a certain amount of negative pressure which is generated in the uh, ventilatory circuits, then the machine starts giving the breath. And there are few variables called as limit variables. And these are set to make sure that all other variables don't go out of control in the process of achieving the control variables. Uh, these variables does not stop the inspiratory phase. They just limit the flow so that the limit are not breached. Each breath can have all type of variables like flow limit, pressure limit and volume limits. And coming to the next important variable is cycling variable. And cycling is nothing but is the variable which decides when uh, an inspiration has to convert to an expiration. It can be four types. One is time cycle, flow cycle, pressure cycle or a volume cycle. Time cycle is where it is clock decides. When there is an inspiratory pass is timed, once the time is over, then ventilator changed from inspiratory to expiration. A flow cycle is one which where when the inspiratory flow rate falls to a certain set rate, then the ventilator allows you to exhale. And coming to pressure cycle, once the set peak inspiratory pressure is reached, the ventilator allows you to exhale. In a volume cycle, once you reach the target volume, the ventilator allow you to exhale. And coming to the next variable is the IE ratio, that is inspiratory to expiratory ratio, which is normally represented as 1 is to 2, that is 1 times the inspiratory time and 2 times the expiratory time. When you uh, lower the IE ratio, it prolongs the expiratory time so that there is more time for CO2 exhalation, which is more favored in an obstructive airway disease patient like COPD patients. And when there is an increase in IE ratio, so that the inspiratory time is increased more than the expiratory time, so it allows uh, improvement in alveolar recruitment and oxygenation, but the main disadvantage of this is there may be an air, uh, air trapping and development of auto peep in case of ARDS patient. And this picture we can clearly see when uh, you change an IE ratio from 1 is to 1 to 1 is to 3, 
there is an increase in the expiratory time than the inspiratory time which allows the alveolar emptying so that it allows complete exhalation of co2 and this picture you are able to see where the inspiratory time is increased from 1 to 3 and expiratory time is reduced from 2 to 1 where the inspiratory time is increased it allows more time for oxygenation and alveolar recruitment but because of shortening of the expiratory time we will be able to see that uh, there is uh, an accumulation of air uh, which may uh, cause auto trapping and development of auto peep. And coming to modes of ventilation, first we will see the control mode of ventilation. Usually, if we talk about control mode of ventilation, it's usually a volume control mode of ventilation, which gives you an optimal control over your minute ventilation. So, whenever you have a patient who have a narrow CO2 range, uh, this mode would be a uh, better choice. And sometimes it is debated that if the patient is an awake, there may be a fighting of ventilator. And with this mode, it is better to sedate the patient to, uh, to a certain extent. And coming to assist control mode, this is a type of mode where you uh, patient can decide on their own respiratory rate, but the tidal volume is controlled and each breath is either a time cycle or a volume cycle. In volume control assist control mode, which gives you a limited control over your minute ventilation in this type of uh, ventilation. The patient may take as many as breath he wants. With volume control assist ventilation, you can control the tidal volume at least. And the next mode is synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. As the name suggests, it is synchronized, synchronized with the patient's effort. So in this mode of ventilation, the patient can decide their own respiratory rate and they can take number of pressure supported breaths. And along with this, the machine will also give you a set number of mandatory breath. If patient makes an effort to take a breath at the same time, like next mandatory breath is due, the ventilator will deliver uh, these breath as an assist control breath with a volume control. And next mode will be your pressure support ventilation mode. In this mode, the ventilator decides only about the pressure level or the pressure support uh, Rest of the other things like tidal volume, respiratory rate, uh, cycling, or either an uh, pass IE ratio, which is all other are decided by the patient. But even in this uh, pressure support ventilation, we can have uh, some degree of control over the tidal volume by adjusting the pressure support uh, uh, such that once you increase the pressure support, you can have a uh, high tidal volume. And if you decrease the pressure support, you can have a low tidal volume and this can be the uh, this can be made uh, depending upon the patient's condition and it's very important to have few monitoring uh, parameters once you put the patient on a ventilator i'm not going to talk about all the monitoring parameter just going to give you an overview of only few parameters and important parameter like a pressure parameter which we usually monitor is uh, three pressure parameters like peak airway pressure, plateau pressure, and uh, the peak. The peak airway pressure is the peak peak, which is measured at the inspiratory, and it's usually a dynamic uh, thing. And there is a risk of tracheobronchial uh, barotrauma when once the peak airway pressure is increased. And P pass or the P plat is the uh, static uh, pressure, which is measured at the end inspiration, and it represents the alveolar pressure. And the next pressure is the PEEP, that is positive end expiratory pressure, which is the minimum pressure which is measured at the end of the expiration and which allows you to keep the alveoli open without collapsing. And also you should know a certain normal values like uh, your resistance will be usually 5 to 8 centimeters of water per uh, liters per second uh, and your compliance will be 1 to 1.2 ml per centimeter of water per kg. And as I told earlier, uh, P plateau or the plateau pressure is uh, most important pressure which we are more concerned by while uh, going in for an invasive mechanical ventilation. And this plateau pressure is measured by uh, giving an inspiratory hold, which is uh, inbuilt in the all type of ventilators. And once you put an inspiratory hold, there is an absence of airflow. 
so this equalizes the airway uh, uh, alveolar pressure to the airway pressure so this is the phase where there is no air flow and the pressure which is reflected is directly represents the alveolar pressure and coming to the ventilatory settings uh, what setting has to be done in different conditions before going in for ventilatory settings it is important to note the uh, pattern of the patient like uh, uh, whether the patient is with normal lung mechanics and gas exchange or the patient is having a severe air flow obstruction or patient is presenting with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure like ards or patient is having a restrictive lung disease or a chest wall disease and even in all type of patient the initial ventilatory setting starts with the setting of an fio2 that is fractional inspiratory oxygen from 0.5 to 1 to uh, to assure adequate ventilation and this fio2 can be lowered within few minutes of initiating ventilation guided by your pulse oximeter or pao2 in an appropriate setting by applying a Peep. And it's also important to note the few problems which can arise immediately after initiating a ventilator settings like airway malposition, any aspiration signs or any hypotension occurs. When coming to ventilator settings in a patient with normal respiratory mechanism and gas ex exchange, uh, the respiratory rate is set at a rate of 12 to 16 per minute with a tidal volume of 6 to 8 ml per kg. Uh, go with an FAO2 of 0.5 to 1 and later you can reduce it. A flow of 40 to 60 liters per minute, IE ratio of 1 is to 2 and PEEP is set at 5 centimeters of water. And usually we repeat an ABG at after an hour and monitor the pressures like peak pressures and plateau pressures and flow waveforms in the ventilators and also the oxygen parameters and then settings are changed accordingly. When we come to a patient with a severe airflow obstruction, like a patient in a COPD patient or in a patient with a bronchial asthma, where you need to have a uh, prolonged uh, expiratory time uh, for uh, eliminating CO2. We try to set a ventilator with a respiratory rate of 8 to 12 breaths per minute with an increase in tidal volume of 6 to 8 ml per kg to maintain the minute ventilation and FAO2 of to start with 0.5 flow of 60 liters per minute and IE ratio is kept to 1 is to 3 to 1 is to 4 so that your uh, expiratory time is more than the inspiratory time and PEEP is kept at the 5 centimeters of water. The main goals in these patients is to minimize the dynamic hyperinflation and prevent auto PEEP and also to minimize the uh, alveolar over distension and CO2 elimination. And most of these patients, uh, like COPD patients, will appear exhausted at the time of initiating the mechanical ventilation and will be sleeping with a minimal sedation. And to the extent that muscle fatigue has played a role, uh, so that uh, muscle rest and sleep is more important in such a patient. So, on approximately of 36 to 48 hours of such rest, uh, rest will restore the biochemical and functional changes with this associated with the muscle fatigue. And then again, after that, you can go for a, a weaning strategy of such patients. When we come to a mechanical ventilation of a patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure or a patient, we call it as an ARDS patient. The main goal is to prevent further damage or to prevent ventilator associated lung injury. So we resort to a low tidal volume strategy of ventilating in a patient with an ARDS. To start with, we ventilate the patient with a tidal volume of 4 to 8 ml per kg and increase the respiratory rate of 24 to 35 to make sure you get an adequate minute ventilation and uh, uh, elimination of CO2 and start with an FAO2 of 1 and to start with a flow of 50 to 60 liters per minute and IE ratio is kept at 1 is to 2 to 1 is to 1.5 so that to allow more time for oxygenation and alveolar recruitment. And PEEP is better titrated between 10 to 14 in ARDS and it's better to maintain a lower PEEP that is possible. And when we talk about PEEP in ARDS, the PEEP titration is still a debatable. And there is a lot of studies which are regarding PEEP which has shown uh, there is no uh, mortality benefit, but it has clearly shown uh, a benefit in terms of oxygenation. And this is a chart which shows an ARDS net protocol where 
uh, which shows the peep titration of low peep and high peep high FAO2 strategy and high peep and lower FAO2 strategy. Uh, we usually resort to low peep high FAO2 strategy in uh, ARDS patients. And when coming to a patient with uh, restrictive lung disease or a chest wall issue, or a patient with a chest wall issue, uh, ventilator setting started with a rate of 18 to 24 breaths per minute, tidal volume of 4 to 6 ml per kg, and FAO2 is uh, to start with uh, 100% and then reduced according to the need, and flow of 40 to 60 liters per minute, and a E ratio of 1 is to 2. And it's also important that uh, we have to know when to uh, wean the patient from the uh, mechanical ventilation. As we uh, know the indications and when to put the patient on the mechanical ventilator, it is equally important when to get the patient out of it. There are a few criteria like readiness criteria where FAO2 is less than 40%, PEEP is less than or equal to 8, uh, PAO2 or FAO2 is more than 200, and he, patients are hemodynamically stable. And the most important thing is either a partial or complete resolution of the primary condition which has led to the mechanical ventilation. And coming to the conclusion of the talk, and I would stress one should be clear in indication to go ahead with the uh, mechanical ventilation, uh, that is invasive mechanical ventilation over a non-invasive mechanical ventilation because invasive ventilation, as I told, it comes with a lot of complications starting from an airway injury to the tracheal bronchial injury to uh, Willy and uh, other things. And uh, it is important to know about the different modes of ventilation and uh, know about the different the basic settings. And it is important to resort to a, a particular mode of ventilation depending upon the patient's primary lung condition and other conditions. And also it's important to have all monitoring parameters of uh, ventilation like uh, pressure monitoring, oxygenation monitoring, and has to be titrated according to that and we should have a ventilator strategy that how to ventilate these patients depending upon the primary illness whether you go for a liberal uh, ventilator strategy or a conservative ventilator strategy like uh, lung protective ventilation strategy in uh, ARDS patient and also you should have a weaning criteria when a patient has to be liberated from the mechanical ventilation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the talk, sir. Very informative and to the point. So moving on to the questions uh, for this session uh, from Dr. Vijay Ravi, which is the initial control mode for shunt pathology and for VBQ pathology for shunt and uh, ventilation profusion mismatch, which is the initial control mode, sir. Sir, are you able to hear me, sir? Murali, sir? Hello, sir. Sir, you are able to hear me, sir. Your oh, voice break out, sir. Your voice is getting. Shanti, I am able to hear. Sir, uh, sorry, Nishant. There is some uh, issue yes, with the uh, network. Just yes, can you now repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. So, question is, which is the initial control mode for shunt pathology and for ventilation perfusion pathology, sir? Mismatch pathology. Okay. Uh, uh, to answer this question, uh, there is no such ideal uh, ventilatory mode for any of the pathology. It is based on the uh, patholo uh, whether it is an obstructive pathology or it is an ARDS. That's all. Whether you uh, go for a uh, low tidal volume strategy or to go for a conventional ventilation. And also, it is important that uh, to start with initial mechanical ventilation, uh, that whatever mode you are more comfortable, it is better to start with the mode which you are comfortable and it has to be titrated with uh, gases and other oxygenation inlets. Yes, so probably that should answer the next question also. If both if both pathologies are present, which mode is ideal? So going to the next question, sir, as per your experience, uh, what would be the ideal day for tracheostomy? Uh, 
for this question uh, you know th there is a lot of debate and lot of papers are going and uh, there is a lot of talks going early tracheostomy or a late tracheostomy uh, which is an ideal and still uh, as far as uh, in our setup it depends on the pathology what we go if the patient uh, do you think it's an head injury patient who is going to be getting ventilated for quite a long period it is better to go ahead with an early tracheostomy so that it gives you a better control over the airway and airway clearance nothing much uh, more advantage as far as consider with an uh, infection rate it's going to be same whether it is a tracheostomized patient or a patient on endotracheal tube and it's uh, basically depends on the pathology if you are going to intubate a patient and ventilate a patient for an uh, pathology like uh, an asthma or copd or a pulmonary edema patient Uh, where do you think the patient can be extubated in few days and then you can wait in such case yes sir so next question dr muthu kumar uh, driving uh, measurement of driving pressure and volume control is okay so how do you measure driving pressure during pressure control ventilation sir sir will you hear me sir అంటారా సో ప్రాబ్లీ విల్ టేక్ దిస్ క్వశ్చన్ లేటర్ వెన్ హీ కమ్స్ బ్యాక్ ఆన్లైన్ అట్ ద ఎండ్ ఆఫ్ నెక్స్ట్ టాక్ సో దర్ ఆర్ ఫ్యూ మోర్ క్వశ్చన్స్ టు బి ఆన్సర్ బెటర్ ది కన్సర్న్ స్పీకర్ ఉంటారు okay we will move to the next session for the want of time we will uh, take this questions from sir once his technical issues get sorted out at the end of next session so moving on to uh, next presentation next presentation is on uh, how to read a ct chest uh, from uh, by dr a sir prakasham sir he is a pulmonologist as well as a trained intensivist so a few words about him he currently works in suraksha hospital salem and he has uh, done his dnb uh, chest medicine from apollo hospitals chennai DTCD from Tanjore Medical College and trained in uh, intensive respiratory care and intensive pulmonology from again from Apollo Hospitals Chennai and he worked as associate consultant there and he also uh, underwent a uh, training in advanced bronchoscopy techniques and ebus rigid bronchoscopy medical thoracoscopy under Dr uh, David P Breen University Hospital Galway Ireland and he has special interest in intensive pulmonology intensive respiratory care asthma COPD occupational lung diseases and almost all uh, respiratory illnesses we know of so over to you sir the session will be on how to interpret a ct chest uh, not for the actually uh, for radiologist for us practically what we should do on bedside and uh, not to miss any important findings over to you sir unmute uh, just some minutes just give me a minute right yes sir sure sir సారీ యూ హెబుల్ టు సీ మై ప్రెసెంటేషన్ నాట్ ఎట్ సార్ ఎస్ సార్ హౌ yes sir yes and go on sir please a good evening one and all it's my pleasure and privilege to be part of this wonderful evening i wholeheartedly thank sks uh, administration and uh, dr nishan and the team for this uh, wonderful opportunity uh we i uh, wholeheartedly welcome you all for the relatively later session of uh, today's program 
uh, CT chest for the collision. I made it uh, uh, easy as far as uh, possible I can. Um, so why we clinicians uh, know about the uh, nuance of uh, interpretation of CT chest and the basics of the CT chest? Is that fact because uh, we are the first person in contact with the patients who uh, seeks uh, um, medical advice for their illnesses. And we'll uh, have a clinical history and we would have examined the patient at the end of the examination. We'll have a, a clinical diagnosis or differential diagnosis. Accordingly, we'll expect some of the radiological findings which will enhance our clinical diagnosis and uh, improve the clinical management of the particular patient. And uh, commonly, we'll come across uh, uh, some of the situations where we'll have a symptomatic patient with uh, abnormal chest X-ray and a symptomatic patient with normal chest X-ray or asymptomatic patient with uh, abnormal X-ray. These are the commonest situations where, we, where we'll order in a CT chest. And uh, before going to the CT chest uh, reading proper, uh, we must know some of the uh, uh, basics of the uh, CT chest. Uh, so a CT scanner uh, makes many measurements of X-ray attenuation, either it's a weakening of the uh, uh, opacity or intensity or increasing intensity from different rotation angles through the cross-sectional plane of the thorax. And it then uses this data to reconstruct the yeah, digital representation of cross-section with each pixel of image representing a measurement. This measurement quantifies the fraction of radius removed in passing through a given amount of material of a certain thickness. This is expressed in Hounsfield unit, which, which is uh, measuring zero in water. And positive Hounsfield units are in muscle, liver, and bone, negative or in lung and adipose tissues. And uh, simply a uh, CT chest or CT scan represents the uh, virtual uh, uh, digital um, uh, dissection of the uh, thorax, inspection of internal organ without their dissection. There are a couple of uh, things we have discussed before this um, uh, uh, further move on. And types of CT chests are commonly standard CT, which is with contrast or without contrast and HRCTs and low-dose CT, ultra-low-dose DC CTs, and angiography and ct guided interventions. Um, the standard or conventional CT, the slice thicknesses are about 3 to 10 millimeter, about 1 centimeter. So the, it, it scans the uh, larger volume in a very short span of time. It covers the full lung, can be used with or without contrast. The main pitfall or disadvantage of um, standard con or conventional CTs, like you no, know, since the slices are a little larger, like you no know, one centimeter cuts, the smaller lesions and you no know, finer details of the uh, particular pathology will get missed in this uh, uh, standard CT. And uh, the next type is uh, uh, high resolution computer tomography, as we know, HRCT. Here, the collimation is on a 0.6 to 1 to 1.3 millimeter and contrast with a 3 to 10 millimeter of uh, conventional CT. Uh, since its uh, collimation is very, very small, the chances of you know, uh, um, having these um, smaller lesions in detail or uh, details of the pathology, fine pathology will be high in uh, HRCT. This is the comparison of standard CT and the HRCT. As you see, this uh, clear details of the uh, pathology in the parenchyma will be depicted in the HRCT. Uh, this is the, again this um, HRCT sampling uh, uh, of a thin on continuous uh, slices between 1 to 1.5 millimeter in thickness. And the main disadvantages of HRCT is like you know, the radiation dose will be very, very minimal compared to the high volume uh, helical CT. For this reason, the younger and more frequently scanned patients will be, uh, you know, uh, HRCT will be the better uh, scan rather than the conventional CT. If you want to have a, a finer details of the uh, lesions, like, you know, 
bronchiectasis, um, interstitial lung diseases, and emphysema, sarcoidosis, and so on. HRCT is the choice of uh, to find out the lesions of these conditions. Another type is low dose CT, where the uh, dose used will be you know less than three to less than one millisieve. It can, it can be used as a screening modality in uh, you know trials and in patients with chronic recurrent pneumonias, where you have to have a uh, frequent follow-up CT scan, and patient with the post lung transplant, where you have to have a regular follow-up CT scan in patient with uh, metastasis or staging, where the low dose uh, uh, scan will be very, very useful. And uh, coming to the next CT type, the CT angiography, where the contrast injector injected into the peripheral vein, injection timing and rate controlled automatically. Dye is where you can want to see, see during scan. It is uh, replaced in conventional catheter angiogram. The main indication for the angiography is uh, suspecting pulmonary embolism, aortic aneurysm, and suspecting aortic dissection. The risks of uh, having this uh, contrast CT is like you no, know, some patient will be allergic to contrast and uh, will can cause it will be a ne nephrotoxic in some patient. So that if any patient, if you want to uh, have a contrast CT done. Before that, you have to ensure that the renal function will be normal. And in some situations, the contrast study will be no uh, uh, has to be uh, done with in caution or it is contraindicated where the impending aortic dissection, where the intramural hematoma is the earliest sign, so may be obscured by this dense aortic contrast. In cases of some esophageal leaks where the or oral contrast may be difficult when it is leaked to detect if IV contrast has been administered concomitantly. Nowadays, we come across uh, like, you know, four, six, eight, 16 slides and 32 slides, so on. It merely indicates the, you no know, uh, the gandria rotation and the slices has been uh, uh, generated by the uh, CT scan. It's a take home information from the slices is, is that the fact is, more the slices, more informative. And if you ordered a, um, a CT scan, usually you will get uh, two pair, two films. Like you no know, one is lung window it's a, or a, a parenchymal window. Another one is mediastinal window or soft tissue window. In some special situation, if you specially ordered for a, a bone window, then they'll give you a bone window. In lung window, as this name implies, it will depict or it, you can clearly see the lung parenchymal uh, uh, lesions or normal parenchyma and the airway pathology and normal airways. And in mediastinal window, soft tissue and the bone uh, muscular layer and subcutaneous fascia and pleural pathologies and mediastinal vascular pathologies or sub uh, uh, pleural pathologies will be well uh, demarcated in mediastinal window. In patient who has a, a polytrauma or chest injury or chest lesions, if you want to have a, a, a look on the uh, bony lesions, then you have to see, you have to ask for the bony window where you can see the rib cage and the uh, spinous and the scapula and the sternum uh, clearly. Uh, if you are in some centers, if you ask for the uh, 3D reconstruction of the bone window, they'll give you 3D reconstruction clearly, where which will help you to ascertain the uh, bony lesions uh, more easily. Uh, this is another uh, depiction of this uh, some, uh, soft tissue window, parenchymal window, uh, the um, bony window, uh, bony window, soft tissue window, and parenchymal window. In uh, uh, soft tissue window, the thyroid, chest wall, pleura will be well, uh, lesions will be clearly seen, and heart and chambers, chambers of the heart and mediastinum and the vascular structures are well, we can easily seen in the uh, soft tissue window. And this bony window, as I said earlier, this bony structures uh, of the rib cage will be easily seen in the bony window. Parenchymal window, the airway pathology, parenchymal and visual, uh, uh, visual lesions or 
clearly seen in the parent tunnel window. Some of the uh, views are uh, important uh, on uh, interpretation of CT scan. Axial view, this is a coronal view, this is a sagittal view. This is a, uh, a pictorial demonstration of uh, uh, these uh, three views. This coronal plane, this transverse plane, when you see from the foot end or head end, this axial view, the sagittal plane. Axial view, either you can see from uh, top to bottom or bottom to top. Coronal view, either from back to uh, front to back or back to uh, front. Sagittal view, side to side views. This uh, views or will uh, enhance your uh, orientation about the lesion and the pathology and adjacent structures uh, of the lesion. So before uh, submitting patient to the CT scan, clinicians should be aware of the fact that uh, uh, if you uh, submit a um, uh, uh, patient for the CT scan, there is a chance of uh, uh, radiation patient has to undergo. Uh, so this uh, risk benefit ratio uh, has to be evo uh, evaluated before putting the patient under the uh, radiation risk of uh, CT scan. And these are the, some of the indications of CT scan and uh, usually the malignancy of the lung, either primary or uh, secondary and staging of the metastatic disease and evolution of SPM, mediastinal pathologies and cardiac tumors and pericardial disease and parenchymal diseases like consolidation lung abscess and uh, post-TB sequelae, ARDS and trauma where you can ask for the uh, bone window specifically pulmonary embolism uh, when you suspect, when you have to ask for the contrast CT and before that you have to ascertain the renal function of the particular patient. And you have to discuss the uh, uh, radiologist which will uh, um, you know, uh, enhance the clinical accuracy and uh, easy to get the findings uh, in the radiologist aspect and plural abnormalities. So to summarize um, CT scans, uh, or the uh, um, uh, are finding the pathology that may be missed on the conventional chest X radiography. Clinicians need to be aware of the potential hormone radiation the patients are exposed to. And benefit and risk of IV contrast should be discussed with the radiologist. Make sure that not only all IV accesses is suitable for the administration of contrast media. Usually, this uh, anticubital line will be preferred. Uh, if uh, possible, um, any other imaging modalities um, for that particular patient is more beneficial, if you think, then go for the uh, particular alternative uh, uh, modalities uh, straight away rather than putting the patient on uh, uh, radiation exposure by doing chest X-ray like an you know, MRI or ultrasound. And uh, not, last not, not least, detailed knowledge of anatomy of the thorax is the must to fully interrupt the CT scan of the chest. So to allow a better understanding of the structures of, of the CT uh, thorax, uh, we can orient ourselves using a familiar PA, chest X-ray PA view. Uh, there is a lot of uh, um, um, clinical materials available on the uh, nuances or techniques of reading chest X-ray, either in the uh, internet or the hot copies or in the uh, classical teaching. But um, I would prefer this you know, uh, extrapolating uh, uh, orientation of our uh, knowledge on uh, chest X-ray into the CT chest. For that, we can uh, divide the uh, chest X-ray PO into you know, four, five, uh, reach, uh, five levels, a great vessel uh, uh, level and aortic arch level, carinal level, carinal level and atrial level and ventricle level. Um, so the great results level where the uh, uh, things, uh, where the anatomical, normal anatomy or trachea and esophagus, uh, just a minute. Esophagus and subclavian arteries and lung apex 
and the sternum and ribs. These are the normal structures at this uh, great vessels area, region. Second is uh, aortic arch region. The uh, normal anatomical structures located in this area is superior vena cava and arch of aorta. And the carinal level, uh, the normal anatomical structures located in this area is you know, ascending aorta, descending aorta, this trachea, tracheal bifurcation, and uh, the aortic arch, and the left, you know, is a zoomed version, left main pulmonary artery, the pulmonary trunk, and the right pulmonary artery. And the ATL level, ATL level, this is a uh, right atrium, left atrium, left main coronary arteries, and right ventricular, interventricular septum, left ventricular ventricle, and left atrium. And the there is a contrast in the right atrium. This right ventricle, interventricular septum, left ventricle, and uh, this is SVC. This is a doom of diaphragm. Doom of diaphragm started seeing once in the uh, ventricular level. In patients with uh, no uh, eventuation of the diaphragm, it may seen much in higher. Level. This is a, a parenchymal orientation of uh, uh, chest, CT chest. At the uh, level of uh, hilum, usually at the level of uh, the hilum, the anterior segment of the upper lobe will be seen. Below that, Superior segment of the lower lobe will be seen. This is the area of uh, anterior segment of the right, left, and the superior of superior uh, segment of the uh, lower lobe, right and left. <clears throat> at the level of carina, at the level of bifurcation, uh, then only you can see the middle lobe, middle segment, lateral segment, inferior, inferior and the superior lingula and the uh, lower lobes, apical, lateral, posterior, medial, same way on the left side. So up to the level of carina, just below, above the carina, uh, the apic and uh, upper lobes are more visible. The below the carina level only you can able to see the medial lobe and the lower lobe segments. The bronchopulmonary segment, so this is a um, bronchial tree. So at the level of carina, all the parenchymal uh, uh, parenchymas are upper lobes. This is a apical, posterior, and anterior. So lingula, apical, posterior, and anterior. So up to the level of carina, only this uh, upper lobe are only visible. If you see any lesions in this particular area at the level of carina, it's a lesion in the upper lobe, either anterior or posterior on the apical region. Just below the carina, uh, bifurcation of um, um, bronchi, right and left, where you can see the middle lobe and lower lobe. This is called veil sign. The so bifurcation of right upper lobe and lower lobe, middle lobe and lower lobe. So it looks like veil, right? The veil sign where the bronchus intermedius are dividing into the middle lobe and lower lobe. So, so at the bottom or in the ventricle level, where you can see the um, uh, almost like whole uh, lower lobe segments in the uh, lowest part of the mediastinum. This is the fissure. This is a fissure. Major fissure. This is a nodal staging. Mediastinal nodal staging. 
So coming to the uh, summary of the uh, things, um, when interpreting CT scan chest, you have to follow a structured logical approach. That will be an um, uh, important thing before starting interpreting and CT chest. A structured, either um, uh, uh, already teach the method or you followed your own method of you know, reading um, CT chest, whatever way, it should be structured in a uniform way. And uh, the images most commonly viewed using lung and media and bone window. You have to see all the windows you know, and correlate the um, uh, lesion. If possible, you, know, you can see the uh, packs. Using the packs, you can see the uh, correlating all the three windows simultaneously can make ascertain the uh, lesion very clearly. And uh, a full review of patient history and examination is very, very mandatory. And the previous imaging, if at all, anytime available, you have to ask them to bring it and compare it with the most recent scan, which, which aids the diagnosis. And uh, ident identify the orientation of lung images on the film, axial image or coronal or sagittal views or you no, know, will help us to you know, orient the uh, images with the normal tissue, which gives a better idea regarding what we are dealing with. So a systematic approach ensures the abnormalities are identified. Easily identifiable anatomical structures will allow the clinician to gain orientation for which we have to have a uh, normal anatomical structures and a particular level of the um, uh, CT scan. And ability to scroll, scroll through the images helps to dynamic assessment of the anatomical differentiation. So if time permits, I'll go with the pathological aspects of the CT chest. Nishant? Yes, sir. Uh, you can go ahead for another five minutes, sir. Okay. So as we discussed before, high resolution CT is the preferred CT whenever possible because it depicts the uh, most detailed manner, the uh, manner of the peripheral or final, final, uh, finer uh, anatomical structures of the uh, lung paranoidal, like the central lobular interstitium and uh, intercept, interlobular septums. All the details will be well picked in uh, HRCT. So this is the most preferred CT uh, in uh, any situation, if uh, possible. So basic interpretation lies in the four uh, 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 approaches. And uh, the first of all, the appearance or pattern of the lesion and location of the lesion and any particular distribution which it follows and any additional findings along with the lesion. So appearance or pattern of the lesion, there are four categories, increased attenuation, like you no know, increased uh, whiteness, increased hyperdensity in X-ray, like kind of thing we mentioned in increased attenuation, which will be grand glass opacity or consolidation, decreased attenuation, linear opacities and nodular opacities. This is the ground glass, ground glass opac uh, opacity. In ground glass opacity, uh, the increased haziness of the lung without obscuring uh, vessels. So the bronchus will be seen as it's called a dark bronchus sign. The lung and the, the opacity or haziness seen without obscuring the uh, vessels. This is ground glass. This is a ground glass uh, opacity. When the opacity obscuring the vessels, then it's called Consolidation, which is it become consolidation, where the airways will be seen causes air bronchial gram. The increased lung attenuation, not obscuring the underlying vessels, will produce ground glass opacity. Acute causes are pulmonary edema, pulmonary hemorrhage, and pneumonia. Chronic causes COP, cryptogenic uh, organized pneumonia, pulmonary alveolar proteins, bronchialveolar carcinoma. This is a ground glassy and going for fibrosis. We commonly come across all these years or past two years, like now, a COVID pneumonia. Consolidation capacities with obscuration of 
pulmonary vessel. Little or no volume loss is the uh, important thing, which is associated with air bronchogram. This is air bronchogram, which is a pathognomonic of consolidation. This air bronchogram. So hollow sign you can see in the aspergillosis, focal consolidation surrounding ground glass opacities seen in aspergillosis. And usually um, uh, you can see the report, there is, uh, they'll mention that you know, uh, there is a air tree in but, but, but appearance of the uh, lesion, something they usually they'll mention in the reports. This is a tree in bud, the pictorial uh, representation of tree in bud. Uh, this is the tree, tree in bud appearance, tree in bud appearance. The classical of uh, bronchodemonium. The another uh, depiction of uh, ground glass opacity and the consolidation. If you uh, consider the fingers or the vascular structures, if it is not obscured, then the ground glass opacity. If it is obscured, then consolidation. Decreased attenuation, usually hyperlucent uh, 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 lesion, where the air trapping is the main cause, where you can see the uh, pathology in emphysema, bronchiectasis, sarcoidosis, HSP, and vasculitis. And cystic lung diseases also will have decreased lung attenuation. LCM, lung and silicon cells, lymphangio, leomatomosis, LCH, lymphocytic interstitial, LIP, pneumocystis, pneumonia. So these are the situations where you can see the you can encounter the uh, low attenuation, honeycombing, bronchiectasis, uh, where you can see the signet train sign and uh, lung cysts and centilobular emphysema. So bronchiectasis, tubular, varicose, and cystic. This is varicose, tubular, and cystic, where the low attenuation will be seen. And emphysema, Centilobular, panlobular, pan and paraseptal. Centilobular, usually associated with uh, smoking, so uneven distribution, mostly, mostly upper lobe involvement. Panlobular, usually seen in younger patients, lower lobe predominance, in, seen in uh, all found antitrypsin deficiency, also in smokers. And uh, paraseptal emphysema, usually in uh, young adult patients. These are, this is the cause for uh, recurrent pneumothorax. When it is rupture causes pneumothorax. Sir, excuse me, sir. For want of time, I think uh, uh, we can post the presentation delegates group and they can go through that, sir. Okay, okay, okay. okay, okay. Uh, we will uh, go on to the questions, sir. Okay, uh, that's okay. the for you. Uh, one minute, sir. So, uh, from Dr. Suresh. Uh, can we see floating ribs 10, 11, and 12 rib cartilages in CT chest or dynamic ultrasound? Sorry, come again. Can we see floating ribs 10, 11, and 12th rib cartilages in CT chest? Um, usually, I know if you are specifically, usually if you are specifically asking for the bone window in a case of any polytrauma, they will highlight the entire uh, I know, uh, rib structures. Uh, um, in a lung bone bone window, or else that's very difficult to see in see in the uh, regular uh, films where, where they they give uh, in bone window. Usually, we won't uh, see able to see. Yes, sir. So I don't uh, see any other questions for this session. So we will end this session, and uh, sir, thanks a lot for uh, your time and uh, sharing the knowledge, sir. And uh, be, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Nishan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And before moving on to the next session, uh, I will take just two questions for uh, the previous session. Due to network issues, Murali sir got uh, uh, disconnected. So uh, over to Murali sir. Just two questions. I selected two valid questions. Uh, one question from Dr. Muthu Kumar. So how do you measure the driving pressure during PCB mode? Murali sir, are you there, sir? Yeah, yes, Dr. Nishan. Yes, sir. So uh, how do you measure driving pressure during pressure control ventilation? Uh, uh, the concept which we usually uh, think that uh, what in pressure control ventilation, the inspiratory pressure which we keep uh, in the setting 
which is the pressure which is required to deliver the volume or the flow of air to the patient's lung what we misinterpret is this is equal to the p plat so there is a lot of confusion even in a pressure control mode uh, it is better to go for an inspiratory pass and look for the p plat and as you everyone knows that driving pressure is nothing but uh, the difference between the p plat and the p uh, which is the driving pressure even in pressure control ventilation you put a uh, uh, inspiratory pass measure the uh, uh, a pressure at the end of inspiration where there is no flow of air which represents the plateau pressure and uh, measure it uh, the plateau pressure and detect with peep which will give you the driving pressure yes sir so last question sir uh, use of simv uh, either volume control pressure control plus pressure support mode versus normal uh, pressure support mode uh, as i told previously pressure support mode is uh, nothing but a pressure support Support. the machine gives only the pressure support for a tidal volume or the breath which generated by the patient it's completely patient driven ventilator uh, the machine is usually going to support with the pressure so that the patient is going to take an adequate tidal volume but in an simv mode you have a mandatory breaths also which has to be set so apart from the patient uh, taking his own breaths there is a mandatory set breath which is delivered in an samv with pressure support mode and also when you keep an pressure support along with an samv mode it makes sure the spontaneous breath which is taken by the vent, uh, patient is uh, having an adequate tidal volume so that uh, uh, it achieves the minute ventilation even in a, a spontaneous breath which is taken by the patient during the uh, samv mode yes sir so just one more question sir flow trigger versus yeah. pressure trigger which is ideal to set uh usually uh, flow trigger is best because uh, both okay. these triggers are generated by the patients and the ventilator has to detect the change in the flow or the change in the pressure so a slight change in the pressure uh, uh, itself can trigger the ventilator which may cause sometimes a, a dyssynchrony with the patient so a flow trigger of 2 uh, liters per minute to 5 liters per minute may be uh, an ideal uh, for a uh, uh, to have a very good trigger sensitivity of the ventilator yes sir hope that answered almost all questions few more questions are there like why low respiratory in uh, 8 to 12 in COPD that will be dealt during uh, a COPD ventilation so and uh, ETC sir one more question sir from Dr. Praveen Chandran is ETC O2 monitoring always needed in a ventilated patient or periodical ABG ah. Uh, as ATCO2 is not mandatory in all ventilator patients. Okay. Uh, now periodic ABDG depends upon the patient condition. As uh, previous speaker who talked about uh, NIV also mentioned, there is no time limit for ABG and depends upon the patient's condition. You can have a specified time period for ABG, either a six hourly or BD or once daily is also enough to look for PO2 values to titrate your ventilation. Yes, sir. So thanks a lot for your time, sir. That was a wonderful presentation again. So uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mishan. Thank you, Dr. Moving Mishan, on. for the opportunity. Please, sir. Thank you, sir. So moving on to uh, next presentation. So uh, final presentation of the day. So uh, uh, weaning and liberation strategies. Uh, you know. So, uh, I invite Dr. Uh, Gopinathan, sir, who is heading intensive care unit at Akhoi Medical Center and Hospital, uh, main center at Coimbatore. Uh, so, he did his undergraduation from Kale Park Medical College and uh, MD Anesthesia as well from there. And uh, he completed IDCCM at Coimbatore Medical Center. He uh, cleared EDIC and uh, he had finished IFCCM and uh, FNCC for a fellowship in neurocritical care. And uh, he has uh, prestigious awards like Anand Memorial Award for Best Outgoing Candidate in IFCCM and Special Interest in Sepsis, ARDS, and Neurocritical Care. And he is heading the uh, intensive care unit at the main center, Coimbatore, uh, sorry, Coimbatore, Coimbatore Medical Center and Hospitals, Coimbatore. And uh, so over to you, Gopi, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nisha, for those kind words of introduction. Am I audible, Nisha? Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, greetings from the Department of uh, Critical Medicine. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Nishan for giving me this wonderful opportunity. 
Thank you, Nisha. So in another, yeah, delayed weaning is associated with increased morbidity, mortality, hospital stay, and risk of long-term care facility discharge. Extubation failure in patient passing an SBT is independently associated with a significant increase in mortality estimated between 25 to 50 percent. Next slide, please. I found this on the web. Therefore, a physician must balance the potential complications of prolonged mechanical ventilation with the risk of extubation failure and subsequent reintubation. The aim of this entire weaning process is to accomplish opportune weaning, that is, weaning within 24 hours. Yeah, weaning within 24 hours of fulfilling the required criteria while preventing premature or delayed weaning. The weaning process comprises almost 40% of total duration of mechanical ventilation. 70% of the time, the weaning is a straightforward process, while 30% of the time, it presents quite a challenge to the ICU physician. Difficulties usually arise in patients with chronic obstructive, restrictive pulmonary disease, in patients with heart failure, and in patients with neuromuscular disorder. Next slide, please. Weaning process is complex. It is multifactorial. There are several methods and techniques to assess whether a patient is ready for weaning. The clinician should choose the proper method for each patient to minimize the risk of extubation failure, as I already mentioned. When liberating a patient from mechanical ventilation is not possible, despite multiple attempts, tracheostomy and transferring the patient to a long-term weaning facility center may be required. If this is not possible, palliative care should be considered as the treatment options. Next slide, please. So what's the difference between weaning and liberation? Way back in 1987, Hall and Wood suggested that weaning from mechanical ventilation, which implies nothing but a gradual withdrawal of mechanical ventilation and concomitant reception of spontaneous breathing, is unnecessary in most of the patients. They proposed that the ultimate objective is not to wean, but to liberate the patient from mechanical ventilation. So liberation will be a better term when compared to weaning, which includes the entire process of eliminating a patient from mechanical ventilation, beginning from the point of identification of readiness to weaning to till extubation. Next slide, please. So basically, liberating a patient from mechanical ventilation involves three steps. The first one being readiness testing, which is the most important step. The second step being weaning, and the third step being the extubation. Next slide, please. So what is readiness testing? It is basically a screening test which uses objective clinical criteria and certain physiological tests which has been applied in patients who has been mechanically ventilated for more than 24 hours daily to assess the possibility of ventilator liberation. The screening test helps us to differentiate those patients who are ready to wean from those patients who are not ready to wean. Thereby, it prevents the complications associated with delayed extubation as well as the complications associated with premature extubation. As, and hence, as I told you previously, this is the most critical step in the entire process of liberating a patient from mechanical ventilation. Next slide, please. So when should a patient be subjected, should be considered that he is ready for weaning? If the, the cause for the respiratory failure has improved, if the patient gas exchange state is reasonably stable, where the PF ratio is more than 150 or SATs more than 90, on a of less than 0.4 and PF of less than 5, pH being more than 7.25, hemodynamically stable, or if there is a requirement iron drops when it is minimal, that is less than 0.1 mics per kg per minute of norad or epinephrine, or five, less than 5 mics per kg per minute of dopamine or dopamine, or the patient is hemodynamically stable, as well as when the patient is able to initiate inspiratory effort. The option criteria being HP more than 7, core temperature more than th less than 38, I'm sorry, and the patient being awake, alert, and easily arousable. Next slide, please.
So daily, when the patient has been subjected to the screening tool, you encounter probably three sets of patients. Either the patient is ready to wean, wherein you can subject the patient to weaning trial and you can consider extubation. Or if the patients, those who are not ready to wean, you need to identify the cause. Probably it could be still the primary process which has led to mechanical ventilation is not resolved. Or it could be due to complications of mechanical ventilation which has to be sorted out before subjecting the patient to weaning trial. The third possibility could be uncertainty, whether the patient is ready enough to undergo this weaning trial. In these set of situations, we can consider using of weaning predators to different to identify those set of patients who will tolerate the weaning trial. For an instance, RSBA, which we commonly use, is one such weaning predator, which helps us to identify reasonably uh, those set of patients who will tolerate this weaning trial. Next slide, please. So the cutoff of RSBI is 105 to identify extubation failure. Some use weaning predators in a structure fashion, while others use them only in case of doubt whether the patient is ready or not. Several of the weaning predators have been described, but all are found to have poor predictive capacity. They are investigational. They have poorly defined thresholds or they require complex manuals for calculations. And literatures have clearly shown that none of these weaning predators were able to differentiate those patients who are able to tolerate the weaning trial from those patients who are not able to tolerate the weaning trial. And hence, it is not mandatory to use this weaning predators, except for RSBA. So just a brief uh, uh, view about uh, some of the uh, weaning predators. Certain weaning predators like based on oxygenation gas exchange like PF ratio or PAO2, PAO2, A gradient dead space. Though this uh, indices are essential to identify whether the patient is ready to wean, but when used alone, they perform poorly. Next slide, please. Similarly, Certain weaning predators based on ability to identify the respiratory system load and capacity like uh, negative inspiratory pressure or respiratory system compliance, resistance or uh, frequency, tidal volume. Uh, all these parameters have not shown to differentiate between those who can be successfully extubated from those who can't be successfully extubated. Next slide, please. So some of them have tried to incorporate these indices into uh, as index, a collective index, so that they try to differentiate whether the discriminability can be improved. That's what they tried, like uh, RSBA, crop index, core index, integrated weaning index, IEQ. Except for RSBA, none of the indices have shown to discriminate between those who can be successfully extubated from those who can't be successfully extubated. Next slide, please. Certain predators require special equipments to measure like uh, P.1, like uh, P.1 by MIP, P surgical pressure by P surgical pressure maximum, O2 COP. Next slide, please. Uh, diaphragmatic ultrasound, PDA by PDA max, a word about diaphragmatic ultrasound, like uh, particularly in patients who have difficulty in weaning, diaphragmatic ultrasound along with uh, echocardiogram can help us to identify patients who will not be able to tolerate the weaning trial. Two parameters are uh, measured with the diaphragmatic ultrasound. One is the diaphragmatic excursion, the other is the diaphragmatic thickness fraction. The cutoff for diaphragmatic excursion is one centimeter and the cutoff for diaphragmatic thickness fraction is 30%. Next slide, please. These are some of the other weaning predators which have not shown much of uh, discriminating ability to differentiate between those who can be successfully extubated from those who can't be successfully extubated. Next slide, please. The negative uh, predictive value of RSBA, if you happen to see it is 95% when compared to the positive predictive value. In other words, when the RSBI is more than equal to 105, wherein the extubation failure 
is uh, can be predicted uh, it can be more better predicted when compared to the rsbi being lesser 105 which can predict successful extubation the it has got a high sensitivity of about 95% while the specificity is less which is around 70% next slide please Next slide, please. Sorry. Yeah. So this RSV was introduced by Young and Tom in the year 1991. The test is ideally conducted over 30 minutes while the patients are on minimal pressure support ventilation with or without small peep. Since its initial description, uh, the results were confirmed in multiple trials, um, small, small randomized studies, in large scale studies, and the test has gained wide popularity and it is also integrated into various ventilator liberation protocols. Next slide, please. There are certain situations where the RSBA can be falsely high, like narrow endotracheal tube, female gender, sepsis, fever, supine position, anxiety, suctioning, and chronic restrictive lung disease. Routine use of RSBA has not shown to decrease the duration of weaning, nor the duration of mechanical ventilation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, sorry. So what method should be chosen to execute this weaning trial once a patient has been found to be ready to wean? There are various options. The most commonly utilized be daily spontaneous breathing trial with an inspiratory pressure support, various studies, have shown it to be efficient, safe, and it is effective. The traditional methods were like pressure support mode of ventilation with gradual reduction of pressure support of about two to four centimeters of water every two hours till a minimum of six to eight centimeters of pressure support is reached. And if that has been tolerated for another 12 hours, the patient is extubated. The other traditional method being uh, intermittent mandatory ventilation usage where uh, the mandatory breaths are gradually reduced till the mandatory breaths are 20% of the total breaths. If the patient is tolerating, then the patient will be extubated. Newer weaning methods include computer-driven automated pressure support mode of weaning and early extubation with immediate use of post-extubation NIV. Next slide, please. A patient is, is said to have undergone successful weaning trial if he has been extubated and there is no need for ventilatory support for the next 40 hours following extubation. On the other hand, he is said to have undergone the trial is said to be failure if any one of the following is present. If the patient fails the SBT during the SBT process per se, or if there is a need for reintubation within 40 hours following extubation, or the patient dies within 40 hours following extubation, then the condition is said to be failure of the weaning trial. Weaning is progress is said to be in present in those set of patients who have been extubated to NIV and still the patients on NIV. Next slide, please. So SBT is a short period of time in which the patient is breathing spontaneously with support as minimal as necessary to overcome the endotracheal tube resistance or without any pressure support. Several techniques are possible, but the basic principle is the same. The SPT was found to shorten the duration of weaning when compared to the traditional modes of weaning like pressure support mode or intermittent mandatory ventilation modes. Some of the techniques to execute the SPT are TPS mode or pressure support mode or CPAP mode. There are controversial results from several studies regarding the superiority of each techniques. Some studies have found no difference between these techniques, while others have shown better success rate with pressure support mode of eight centimeters of water and zero peep when compared to TPs. Next slide, please. This pressure support mode, which has been executed in SBT, helps not only to decrease the work of breathing associated with the resistance of endotracheal tube, but also helps ventilator monitoring, system, monitoring systems and alarms to alert the clinician if there are changes in the patient's respiratory rate, tidal volume, or minute ventilation. 
whereas such alerting possibility is not possible if a patient has been subjected to TPS mode of weaning trial. Ventilator support in the form of CPAP in patients at risk for acute cardiac pulmonary edema and in patients with acute hypercapnia from obstructive lung disease may result in falsely reassuring SPD. Since CPAP is a form of therapy and it reduces the work of breathing for both of these conditions, especially in COPD patients with dynamic hyperinflation. A TPS may be more appropriate in such conditions, particularly when patients fail in initial pressure support mode of ventilation, SBT method. Next slide, please. So this diagram depicts that pressure support mode is, has got high sensitivity, while the TPS mode is highly specific. Next slide, please. In recent years, automated okay. modes of SBT has been possible due to the development of closed loop ventilators. These ventilation modes or mainly pressure control and pressure supported, but the settings are changed automatically by the ventilator based on oxygen saturation and ATCO2 monitoring. Upon activation of automated SBT modes, the ventilator decreases support and monitors the physiological parameters, including the heart rate, oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, tidal volume, compliance, ETCO2, and RSBA. <laughs> Sorry, Sean, just a minute. Now, after completing SBT for a predefined time, the ventilator alerts whether the patient is ready for extubation or not. However, there is positive of data comparing automated SBT to manual SBT. Next slide, please. The duration for SBT traditionally was two hours. However, recent studies have shown not much of a difference between 30 minutes versus two hours. If the duration of mechanical ventilation is less than 24 hours, generally SBT is not recommended if the duration of ventilation is between 1 to 10 days, most often 30 minutes of SBT is enough. If the duration of mechanical ventilation is more than 10 days, probably we need to individualize. And most often, a prolonged period of SBT of 2 hours is recommended, particularly in patients with chronic respiratory failure. And those patients who have failed their initial SBT trial of 30 minutes, subsequent SBT trials should be definitely 2 hours. Next slide, please. So during SBT, if patient encounters any of the signs, symptoms, or changes in uh, monitoring parameters, which will help us to identify whether the patient is able to tolerate the SBT or not, like, like agitation, anxiety, uh, altered mental status, diaphoresis, cyanosis, increased respiratory efforts. Next slide, please. Or a drop in saturation or compromise in the gas exchange. Uh, tachypnea, tachycardia, hemodynamic instability, or arrhythmias. So all this is things during monitoring uh, while conducting SBT will help us to identify whether the patient is able to tolerate SBT or not. Next slide, please. On the other hand, if the patient passes the SBT successfully, the patient is comfortable during the SBT trial of 30 minutes, extubation should be performed. If the patient fails the SBT, then the ventilator should be set to the pre-SBT setting and a workup should be done to determine the cause for the failure and appropriate measure should be instituted. In the meanwhile, daily SBT should be considered. When there is a doubt regarding the certainty of SBT, ABG can add to your clinical value. Next slide, please. Some of the reasons for the SBT failure and the proposed management includes it could be due to weaning in this pulmonary edema when the patient is switched over from negative pressure, positive pressure ventilation to negative pressure ventilation. The preload increases and also the afterload and also the heart is put under increased cardiac work in order to meet the increased work of breathing, eventually leading to uh, diastolic dysfunction, elevation in diastolic pressure, pulmonary capital pressure and pulmonary edema. So this can be managed, identified clinically as well as uh, by chest X-ray, as well as with bedside ultrasound, and also with if there is pulmonary artery catheter in place. And fluids should be managed optimally with the help of diuretics. The other possibility could be oversedation, which can be managed by means of protocolized uh, sedation management. Uh, it could be due to delirium as well, where you can try pharmacological as well as non-pharmacological measures. 
to reduce the incidence and also to treat if the delirium has happened. It could also be due to bronchospasm where you can address with bronchodilators. Next slide, please. Or it could be due to unresolved pulmonary infection, which can be picked up clinically or with the help of imaging, also with uh, lung ultrasounds. Uh, you can use some clinical pulmonary infection scores to better uh, risk stratify these patients and can be managed with antibiotics. It could be due to uncontrolled arrhythmias, wherein you need to identify the cause for the arrhythmia, optimize the electrolytes as a base imbalance, and treat with antiarrhythmics. It could be due to diaphragmatic dysfunction, which can be identified with the help of diaphragmatic ultrasound, which I've mentioned already. Wait 24 hours for the next SBT. Consider higher support settings when subsequently patients subject for the next XBT. Sorry, next slide, please. The pathophysiological mechanism underlying these SBT failures could be due to respiratory load, increase in respiratory load, or increase in cardiac load, or it could be the neuropsychological. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, sorry. Or it could be due to neuromuscular problems, or it could be due to increase in metabolic uh, disturbances, or it could be due to nutrition disturbances, or it could be due to as simple as anemia per se, severe anemia. Next slide, please. So weaning difficulty has been classified into three types based on the duration of weaning process or based on the number of attempts required to extubate these patients. So generally 85% of the patients encounter simple weaning. That is, they have a successful extubation at the first attempt itself. And their IC model risk is hardly 5%. In 10 to 15% of the patients, they encounter difficult to wean, wherein they have failed their first attempt at extubation or SBT. However, with two further attempts or within a week of attempt, these patients got successfully extubated. Their ICU mortality risk is roughly around 25%. In 5% of the patients, they encounter prolonged weaning, wherein despite three attempts of SBT or they take more than a week for weaning. So they are said to have prolonged weaning. And though they are only 5%, if you happen to see, the ICU mortal risk is, risk is close to 60%, quite very high. Next slide, please. So once a patient has successfully passed an SBT, extubation should be performed, as I told you. Two things should be considered before extubation. One is the ability to maintain upper airway, patent, and intact reflexes and the ability to clear the own secretions. That should be ascertained before extubating these patients. Those patients who require suction frequency more than once every two hours, they are considered unsafe for extubation. Similarly, those patients who speak expiratory flows less than six liters per minute, they are also considered unsafe for extubation and better to postpone extubation in these sector patients. The physician who performs extubation must Keep in mind that despite taking all precautions, the patient might fail immediately and be prepared for reintubation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, cuff leak test, a word about cuff leak test, like it should be done in patients who have got a high risk for post extubation spider due to laryngeal edema. Not all patients encounter laryngeal edema. So, this test is not sensitive nor specific. So it is performed by deflating endotracheal tube cuff and measuring the difference between inhale and exhale tidal volume during volume control mode of ventilation. The cutoff being less than 110 to 130 ml or less than 12 to 24 percent of the inhale tidal volume. If the test is positive, that is, the patient suffers from laryngeal edema, <coughs> the course of steroids should be given before next evaluation. Next slide, please. So. These sector patients are said to have a high risk for laryngeal edema. So in these sector patients, definitely we need to consider doing cuff leak test. For us other situations, cuff leak test is not necessary. So elderly, female gender, prolonged ventilation, particularly more than a week, large diameter tracheal tube, GCS less than eight, traumatic intubation, or those patients with the history of asthma. Next slide, please. 85% of the time, the risk of reintubation is almost very meager. So usually these patients post extubation, they are managed with low flow oxygen, with nasal prongs or as with simple mass. 
15% of the patients, they are at the high risk for reintubation within 48 hours of extubation. Occasionally, a patient might be, will be comfortable with HFNC even without over hypoxemia. Caution is exercised in these set of patients and they should be closely monitored for next 12 to 24 hours. And if there are no alarming events, they can be safely discharged from the ICU. Next slide, please. So these patients where there is high risk for reintubation, 15% of the patients, they should be closely monitored and treated appropriately, aggressively to prevent reintubation. So high risk patients are considered to be those whose cough is ineffective, who need suction frequency of suctioning more than once every two hours, who are in positive fluid balance, who are intubated because of pneumonia, who are not fully conscious, and who suffer from congestive heart failure or COPD. Next slide, please. Applying HFNC or NAV to these set of high-risk patients might be beneficial, particularly those patients who suffer from COPD or from congestive heart failure. And trials have shown that extubating COPD patients to BiPAP have reduced the duration of mechanical ventilation, length of ICU stay, and hospital stay. So HFNC is found to be non-inferior to NAV, particularly for hypercapnic respiratory failure. On the other hand, when a patient develops a respiratory failure following uh, probably type 1 respiratory failure, applying HIV, I mean HFNC or uh, NAV might be harmful as usually it does not prevent the reintubation, but rather only postpones it. So delaying the reintubation and uh, intubating patient in the last minute definitely will increase the morbidity and mortality as well. Reintubation per se is a bad prognostic factor. It is associated with uh, longer ICU stay and hospital stay, more probability of infections, and high mortality risk. Next slide, please. The criteria for extubation failure being tachypnea, tachycardia, or uh, clinical signs of increased work of breathing, or hypoxia, or hypercapnia. Next slide, please. It could be the cardiac risk factors or it could be non-cardiac risk factors. Cardiac risk factors being known as ischemic heart disease patients with severe LVD or patients who have been having positive fluid balance, which I already mentioned the preceding 24 hours, BNP increase of more than 20% during SBT, reduction in central venous oxygen saturation of more than 4.5% during SBT. The non-cardiac risk factors being prolonged mechanical ventilation, chronic lung disease, weak cough, elderly, abundant secretions, Jesus less than or equal to 10, HP less than 10, and lack of conflict. All these patients are high-risk patients where they contribute, uh, they account for about this 15% of high-risk patients for reintubations. Next slide, please. So moving on to management of SBD failure in difficult to wean patients. As I already told, like those patients who fail the first attempt, but pass after next two attempts, or take less than a week to wean. They are said to be have uh, difficult to wean. So generally, pressure support mode of ventilation is uh, adopted to handle these set of patients. Some patients might require mandatory minute ventilation as well. The duration of SBT, as I told you already, should be definitely longer since they have failed the first attempt. In if congestive heart failure is suspected as a reason for SBT failure, it might be better to perform SBT with the TPs. This will allow to examine whether the patient can tolerate the absence of pain. Next slide, please. Uh, prolonged waiting, as I already told you, those sector patients who require like more than a week or more than three attempts of SBT, they are said to be have prolonged waiting. Though they are uh, the incidence is less, but their morbidity and mortality is very high, and they might require tracheostomy as well which will help to improve the communication, decrease the need for sedation, ease the nursing care, and allow for transfer to a long-term weaning facility. Most often, it is due to the imbalance between the respiratory system load and the capacity of the system. And the causes are usually multifactorial. Uh, usually, you need to take a structured approach, identify uh, the multiple causes, involve a multidisciplinary team, to, opt to adopt a better strategy in safely weaning these sector patients. Next slide, please. Outcomes of long-term rehabilitation wards, like 55% of patients are successfully weaned. Their average time to wean is approximately 30 days. 
and approximately 40% of patients survive one year. Only 40% survive one year. 15% they remain ventilator dependent. That is, they were not able to wean even beyond three months. And their one year survival is hardly 20%. 30% of patients, they died during the admission in the long-term rehabilitation ward per se. In ventilated dependent patients, it is important to discuss with the patient or with the caregiver and explain the possible quality of life that we encounter. And if appropriate, the discussion of palliative care should be done. Next slide, please. I'm sorry for this poor image. This is just a flow chart which explains the entire uh, uh, talk like in one slide. Next slide, please. So to conclude, weaning is a process of liberating a patient from mechanical ventilation. Whenever a patient is ventilated for more than 20 per hour, the weaning process should be structured. This allows for patient safety and avoids unnecessary extubation failure, which worsens the prognosis. In most cases, the patient will be extubated without complications. In a minority of cases, special attention should be given to a pathological process that might endanger the patient to extubation failure. In severe cases, weaning will be a long process performed in a dedicated ward. Next slide, please. So, so this is just like A, B, C, D, uh, A to Z of all the things which we do related to weaning. Next slide, please. For want of time, I'm skipping. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Nisham. Sorry for the... Uh, no problem, sir. No problem. It was a wonderful presentation. So it was a nice insight for us to how to uh, wean a patient off ventilator. So uh, we have two questions for you, sir. Yeah. The first is uh, from Dr. Muthukumar. Uh, ROCS index. How good is it in predicting weaning? ROCS no, index. No, the entire topic is to do with invasive mechanical ventilation, whereas ROCS index is to do with the non-invasive ventilation. Definitely has got a good discriminating ability about the need for requirement of invasive ventilation. And it has been uh, reasonably well validated in trials. And obviously, we have used it in the COVID pandemic time when yes, there was a capacity of invasive mechanical ventilation. Yes, sir. So, second question Is hydrocortisone man mandatory for reducing cord edema? If so, how long? What is the dose? Definitely not for all patients. As I already told you, the couplet test is neither sensitive nor specific. Only in those sector patients where there is a risk for laryngeal edema, in those sector patients, you can consider steroids. There are no strong RCTs, but studies have shown that uh, steroids in these high-risk patients prior to extubation and also following extubation has found reduced reintubation. The dose yes. being interpreted is on 40 mg, 4 hours prior to extubation, and it should be repeated for thoroughly for four doses, next four doses. Yes, high, uh, 40 mg, sir. Yeah, 40 mg for us prior to extubation. And uh, sir, uh, you mean a uh, salomidrol or a uh, prednisolone or hydrocortisone, sir, or dexa? Methyl prednisolone. Which one, sir? Methyl prednisolone. Methyl prednisolone, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so, hope that answered the question. So, thanks once again for your time and sharing the knowledge, sir. I'm extremely sorry for the technical issues, Nisha. No problem, sir. So, it was uh, so our back end team had uh, made it, uh, made an alternate arrangement. No issues with that, sir. Please, sir. Thank you, thank you, Nishan. Thank you once again for giving this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Sir, and uh, and uh, one, one more thing. Uh, yeah. Thanks uh, uh, accepting for uh, pre-poning the talk from uh, Thursday to, for, to today, sir. It's thanks a lot for that, sir. Ready. So it's a special time. mention regarding that because uh, uh, at the last minute, uh, I wanted to pre-pone this for due to some other unforeseen circumstances. Yeah. Thanks once again for that, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Nishan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So uh, we end this session today. Uh, hope uh, it had been useful. And uh, we'll meet you tomorrow again, uh, sharp 7 p.m. Uh, with uh, uh, graphics, uh, ventilated graphics. And uh, one more uh, small uh, uh, announcement like, uh, uh, today we shared the video, but uh, I think it was been appropriately circled in different groups before, even before the uh, program uh, got uh, over. We have five more days. So management and organizing team has decided uh, not to share the video uh, till the program gets over and it'll be scrutinized before sharing. So probably uh, after, by the end of this month, we'll be able to share the video. Definitely will be sharing, but uh, by the end of this month. Thank you once again. Good night. See you tomorrow. Thank you.